Great to be back uh, alongside my co-host Johan for another exciting accounting tech conversation. I think it'll be a nice deep one today, trying something a little bit different. We're joined by a very special guest, uh, one of the earliest early adopters of the Early Adopters Hub, uh, John Jenkins, founder of Hindsight. Awesome to have you with us today, John. Thanks, Jack, and I really appreciate getting the time to talk to you guys today. Yeah, no, looking forward to the conversation. I'm sure there'll be a a ton of insight for the listeners. Uh, As we always do, before we get into that, I just wanted to give a little bit of your CV uh, so that everyone understands the journey you've been on. But obviously, you're an accountant by trade, as many of our guests have been, as many accounting tech founders are. Uh, You understand the industry from the inside and out. You spent a number of years in in uh, industry, you know, working as a management accounting, uh, management accountant, um, FC roles, you know, uh, various different businesses. And then obviously you moved over to more of the virtual CFO and outsourced finance space. So you kind of had both sides of the, the accounting world covered. But then I think it was about 2012, you shifted gears, maybe the entre- entrepreneurial bend in you got the better of you and you started a couple of businesses, uh, smart and even learning and that seemed to be that, especially even learning seemed to be your first foray into the the helping small businesses and accountants with their tech stack kind of space. You know, you could sounds like you could see the overwhelm that was happening there. And then the last ten years of your career have, I suppose, doubled down on that uh, number of different roles, number of different businesses that have all been focused on or in the tech for small businesses and accountants. The last of which, the most recent of which, and the the, the focus of our conversation today, uh, your first venture, I suppose, into the startup world, building your own product, which was Hindsight. So, um, yeah, keen to get into this story because I know there's a lot to it. Uh, but as I said earlier, we want to kind of take this a little bit differently. I'm actually going to let Johan run today's call. I know you guys have worked quite closely together over the last few years, and he has some important context that I think will be make for an interesting an interesting chat. So Johan, I'll uh, hand over to you and take it away. Thanks, Jack. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, and yes, uh, I kind of realized, John, this is an opportunity for a bit of a special episode. Uh, you know, it, it's a big relief of ours. We we're very hands-on with what we do with startups. Like we see the, the startup journey very up close and it's often not as glamorous as the uh, influences and the LinkedIn posts and inspiring Steve Job quotes make you think. And there's a lot of value in actually like also talking about the more difficult journeys and, and the failures. Um, and you're quite a rare founder that, you know, I worked with you fairly closely for two years and I know you're very like open, you're, you're, you're happy to open some wounds and rub some salt into them and then dig a bit deeper into that wound to kind of like really understand what happens there. And there's incredible value for for founders and founders to be to to learn from that that's quite often when new startup founders they only hear about the success stories and they don't learn from the failures and they just repeat the the same mistakes so this is kind of like the the special episode we'll see how long we we, we do it uh, to essentially do a post-mortem on your startup uh, hindsight where you decided to shut down uh, fairly recently so it's a bit of a unique opportunity to do a postmortem on a body while talking to the body, but okay, maybe that's a bit too morbid, Jack. You can cut that out in the editing. Uh, but anyway, and, and like Jack alluded to, uh, I've got a lot of context. We work very closely for a couple of years with you waking up at 5 a.m. for our calls, you over in the UK, me over in Australia. And for me, there is a personal frustration there, personal disappointment, because I felt you came out of the early adopters hub, you had some initial product market fit, you had some word of mouth, you had like some paying customers. Uh, you know, every time someone would raise a frustration with one of the incumbents on a Facebook group, you'd get like 20 leads and it would even be hard for you to service it. And, and that in itself is something a lot of startups would, would kill for. Like it's, it's very hard to get that. Um, and still the end of the journey wasn't quite what I wanted or especially what uh, you wanted, uh, it made me realize as well, uh, you know, product market fit is very important. I still think that's what a lot of startups in this space and in general uh, miss. They, they they just don't understand the problem enough. They don't understand their target audience enough. They don't have enough empathy uh, and they focus a bit too much on raising money and marketing rather than solving problems for the users. 
but still that's not quite everything. So enough of a setup from, from my perspective and over to you, John. So essentially you had a couple of uh, separate journeys with hindsight, uh, hindsight version one and hindsight version two, where we met for version two. So why don't you start a little bit by talking about hindsight version one, uh, what prompted you to start that? How was that journey? What were the mistakes that you've learned from it? Uh, and maybe finishing on what was your motivation to then try again? Yeah, so, I mean, ultimately, version one of hindsight was way back in 2014. Um, the company's been in existence since March 2014. I think we started building probably 2013. Um, the idea came about of working. One of my clients was a software developer. And he was extremely frustrated, even with using zero. So obviously we're going back to, you know, early zero, like, you know, he was on zero 2011, 2012, um, and being a software developer, okay, we have bank feeds and things like that. So it moved on quite a bit compared to traditional accounting, but, uh, we're both still frustrated that I couldn't service him with the type of information, um, that he required. Uh, and when we got into the nitty gritty of it, it was like the way in which I worked was about as efficient as it could be at that point but there were still a lot of things that could be better um, and ultimately I wanted to try and scale the outsourced kind of finance service that I've been providing to clients across all of my clients that were on zero because at that time obviously everyone was selling you know real-time information but the reality is and probably still today it's not real-time information you've got the ability to provide real-time information but that's not what we were you know, able to, to do from a capacity point of view. So we just sat down in an office in Bournemouth one day with a whiteboard and just started throwing things up on the board to see what was interesting. Um, and from his point of view as a client, what were his pain points? What were the things that he worried about? What concerned him that he didn't know um, that were easy enough to service via zero if we just had the ability to, you know, get that on a a multi-client basis so all the clients in one go rather than trying to tap into each individual uh, business so that's where kind of version one came from we actually exhibited at um, zericon 2015 with a i say an mvp because um we just had kind of front screens cobbled together that you clicked on buttons and it looked like there was something working i mean there was some data in the background but it wasn't and if you can imagine kind of back in 2015 it was at Battersea evolution i believe um, people would just kind of get in onto the cloud and that was a big thing in its own right. So when we came along with this concept of it's great, you've got your client on zero, but that is just the starting point. That is a very early kind of, you know, dipping the toe in the water. Here's another idea that you get all of your clients into one place, extract their data and manipulate it and flag up alerts and insights that can help you across your entire client base portfolios, managers, it was just way over people's heads. It was just too much for them to kind of, you know, grasp that concept. Um, so we'd been working on it in the background for about two years, building this thing out. And I was using it in my practice and my practice was going really well. Um, my co-founder Lee at the time, his software development company was going through the roof and he went from like working on his own to having a team of 15. Um, and we just got to a point where both of our businesses were accelerating. And we weren't getting any traction with hindsight because we were too busy. Um, he was getting frustrated because I was looking for perfection because I had a list of 55 alerts that I wanted him to build. And I think we were up to about probably 45 to 50. Um, and at that point, he was like, I can't keep throwing time energy at this when I'm making good money doing my other stuff as I, I was as well. So at that point, we just we had to mothball it. Um, you know, we were both so busy. So we kind of decided at that point that despite it was it was a passion and a pet project and we were really interested in it. We didn't need to do it. Um, and we were, we were so early to market. Um, Jack mentioned even learning, um, even learning was the same. Lee and I together built a certification in cloud computing and it's an actual qualification that you could get. We spent a year putting together lessons, lesson plans, assessments for cloud products like Google Workspace, MailChimp. This is when they were like really, you know, kind of just happening. 
Um, and we did loads of webinars and we've got business owners into rooms and we were spending the day training them on how to set MailChimp up and do this, that, and the other. Again, there was just no market for it. We were, we were passionate about it. We were interested in it. We knew it had legs, but we ran out of steam before we got any form of traction whatsoever. And when you're earning money doing something else and it's a side project, it's very easy to drop that side project and go off and do something else. Because we've all got to pay our bills, right? And do, do you think, John, there was like a big issue of being too early to market? Yeah. I think if you look at my uh, history on LinkedIn, you'll see it's littered with um, early ideas that have not come to fruition because whilst it's new and it's exciting and it's interesting to you, that doesn't mean that there's a big enough market for you to turn that into a business. Now, that's fine if you can keep your overheads low and you can keep the enthusiasm and passion going for something. That's not, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, I think it's when you try to run too quickly and you're waiting for everyone else to catch up with you. If you've got an idea and you think you've got to wait two years for the market to catch up with what you're doing, then, then forget it. Um, you're just going to end up in a world of pain. I mean, but isn't that something that so many founders feel they have to do is, you know, be the visionary to pull the market toward where they want it to go? So how, how do you reflect on that now, having been there yourself? It's, it's a really good point, Jack. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you want you want to be a visionary, you want to be out the front, you want to be leading. I think there's a difference between doing that and running a sustainable business. They're not the same thing. If, if you have to cultivate and grow a customer base, it's going to be a long period of time before you are in a position that you can pay your bills. Um, that's fine if you've got loads of investment and you've got a runway and you're able to do that. Um, and I'm sure we'll touch on that in, you know, in, in a later question around, you know, I didn't get to that point. I didn't have, you know, millions of pounds burning a hole in my pocket to, you know, to spend in that respect. So, um, you know, we decided to try and bootstrap it for as, as long as possible and then probably left it too long before we um, got to the point where we were we were looking to raise money because that's that in itself is a, you know, everyone told me that's that's a full-time job and I was like, yeah, whatever, it's fine, it'll be five minutes, I'll have a couple of conversations with people and it'll all be good. Um, and it's just, and it's not. So, John, do you think that ultimately um, there was a bit of that tension that, again, maybe it's a bit of that, you, you know, you think of the vision and the mission and the passion, you can drive the market forward. But do you think that that's a bit of a topic I, I, I angle, as, as we kind of like say on this podcast? It sounds good on the surface, but... I think if anything we've learned in 2022, 2023, you can have a lot of VC money, you can have a big vision, but the market always has the last say. Is that a big takeaway you took from that? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the, mar the market will dictate whether your vision, your passion, your ideas are, are any good or not from a financial point of view. Um, you know, I'm still sat here thinking I'm proud of what I built. I, I, every time I log into the product, I'm like, this is actually a really useful tool. I'm still convinced at some point in the future that this will be a mainstay, that the type of product we've built with hindsight with the alerts and insights will be a mainstay inside of your general ledger software. Because it just, well, don't, be. just be. don't jump here to version two and the rest of the journey, uh, John, let's uh, be, be patient. So we're done with version one, that was behind you. you. You went back to your practice that was doing well, you were making money. Uh, so before we kind of move a little bit to, to version two, what, what motivated you to try again? I've got the practice to a point near hand where um, I was bored. Um, I'm quite disruptive when I'm bored. I need something to be doing. Um, and it was at that time again, I'd, we were doing a lot of software projects. So we'd set up a kind of side company called Just That Tech, um, which still kind of, you know, lives as a, a, a business called Finance Project. And... My second CTO um, and second co-founder, if you can have a second co-founder, Mike, um, we'd worked together in a traditional accountancy practice and we car shared. 
and he was like, you know, he's an IT guy and he's a developer. Um, and I would just quiz him in the mornings on the way to work about anything IT related. You know, could, could we do this? Or can we build a dashboard that does that? And why don't we do this? And how does that work? Um, and out of those conversations, we just, you know, grew a friendship first and foremost, but we kind of just, you know, understood each other um, from a technical and a financial, you know, kind of level. Um, so Mike came into Smart. And we were doing a lot of projects with accountants, but accountants wouldn't put my accountancy practice in front of their clients to deal with tech projects um, because they were worried we're going to steal the clients. So we set up this other company called Just That Tech. Mike started working through Just That Tech and we were doing some kind of a lot of zero migrations, training, um, some bespoke development work. Um, And it was through doing that that I was looking at my thinking, your skill set is wasted just plugging together off the shelf product um the practice it kind of was running itself um i got bored with that and it's like why don't we build a hindsight version two because that will really help us kind of move you know move things on again um get my interest levels going on the on the accountancy side and of course the bigger the team i built with smart the more frustrated i became as a practice owner that those things from 2014, 2015, those problems were still there. They still persisted. But then when I was scaling a team, I was just looking at the inefficiencies of what we were doing and just going, I don't want to scale this business, not in its current format. And that's why we decided to build version two of hindsight so that we could, you know, sort out the pain points within our own practice. And I knew that if I was suffering that pain, you know, I've been in, been in and around the the industry long enough now and spoken to enough people to know that they were also, you know, suffering the same pain points. Um, So that's why we, I think about 20, probably mid 2018 towards the 2018 end of, um, we started building again from scratch, um, a new version of of hindsight. So at that point and all the lessons you had from that first journey, what did you learn from that and did different second time around? <laughs> what did I learn? Uh, I don't know. Um, ultimately, I guess perfection is not an option. Okay. Um, if you're waiting to build the perfect product, you'll be waiting forever. So with version two, we did not wait until I'd been messing around with it for two, two years before you know, even showing it to somebody. Um, we were using it within the, the practice. Uh, we got it to a point where it was doing some stuff and it was okay. We were ready to launch. We thought at the end of kind of 2019, we were ready to launch. And I think that's when we then, you know, started talking and, and kind of got together. And it was after working with the Early Adopters Hub. You know, again, with my experience and my background, you think, oh, okay, I know all of this stuff. Um, this is good enough. And then when we put it into the hands of other practices, we realized that, not everyone works in the same way that I do. Um, their, their practice is structured differently. They have different process and procedures. Um, and I think probably the biggest thing that I've learned, you know, from, from doing that was our books and records were in pretty decent order for our clients when using hindsight, when you started plugging other people's data into it and you were getting thousands of alerts, that was quite frightening. Um, and that was, you know, ultimately, we spent another year working with the early adopters hub to kind of refine what we were doing, because, um, you know, as you know, in those first early beta tests, when we turned it on, people were just going, holy crap, um, I can't deal with this It's too much. And I'm kind of going, well, that just means the data is shite and we need to sort it out, people. You can't hide from it that the facts are, you know, the facts are there. Um, so yeah, I think the biggest thing I learned from the first one is, is perfection is not an option. The second one was concentrate on one thing. Um, when I did version one, I spoke to Guy Pearson from Ignition um, at, I think, the first zero kind of went to, and he had sold his practice and obviously started down the Ignition route. And the, and the piece of advice he gave me was pick one thing and just do that and do it well. And I went, nah, that's not me, Guy, I'm a superhero, I can do three or four things at the same time, you watch me, watch me fly. Um, And all those years later, I was like, I should have listened to Guy, Um, I should have just picked this one thing. So that's what I did in the end. Um, The practice ran itself, and I threw it, and we kind of stopped the projects on Just Add Tech, 
and I threw myself into hindsight and then literally I sold the practice um, because it was still a distraction. It was still there in the background and ultimately I needed some cash to, to fund what we were doing with hindsight. So in the end, I sold the practice, um, you know, which with the benefit of hindsight probably wasn't the smartest thing because it was generating cash and bringing some money in. Um, but hey ho, such is life. <laughs> I think the biggest danger of this episode is that doing a postmortem for a startup called hindsight. There's a lot of jokes that can be made, <laughs> but I'll put that aside for a minute. Uh, so you did the second time around. You, you did really go all in, like selling your practice and basically using that as your seed round or pre-seed. Uh, that's not a small uh, leap. So. What gave you the confidence to take such a leap this time that you're selling a profitable business that's reliable income? I think ultimately having had that first experience of knowing that playing at it is not going to, you know, cut the mustard and you need to, you know, you need to do it. I know everyone will probably say, why the hell did you do that? You, you, you know, why did, would you sell a business and put all of that money into another, you know, into another business? You don't do that. Um, you know, was I confident? Yeah, of course I was confident. I wouldn't have done it if I wasn't confident that we were going to, you know, going to do something with the business. I had confidence in myself and in Mike and that we would build something that was, you know, that was a decent product. Um, and I just thought that would be enough. I thought that will be, you know, that will be sufficient to get us to where we, you know, need to be and generate some income and we'll, we'll grow, you know, we'll grow organically and it will be, everything will be fine. Um, you know, if you gave me some money now, I'd still be confident that, you know, given a period of time, we'd be able to get this to a point that it would, you know, it would be a decent business for, you know, for somebody. Um, but yeah, it's just, I've always had supreme confidence in myself, Johan. I still do now. Um, so there was never, ever, an element of doubt in my mind that I wouldn't make this a success. Um, and therefore the idea of putting my own money into the business is if I'm not going to back myself, then why should I expect somebody else to do that? And that's exactly how I still feel about it now. Um, and if I had another pot of money, I'd back myself again. Um, that's just because that's who I am as a, you know, as a person, I've always been driven that, if I want to do something, the only person I can rely upon is myself. Um, and therefore, you know, I want the other people around me to be confident in, in me as a person to know that I will, you know, move heaven and hell to get to a point where we achieve something together. Um, and if that means I have to go through a, an extreme amount of personal pain to get there, then that's, that's fine. It's all part of the, it's all part of the process. Um, and I think that's how we, you know, that's how we learn and it's how we know how far we can push ourselves. I think that that piece on confidence as a founder is a very interesting one to unpack. Uh, the, the founders we've worked with over the course of the last three years, there's, there's, a, it's like an impossible, it feels like an impossible job to be a founder because you have to have a supreme level of confidence that you can do this. Otherwise, why would you try? Um, why would you quit your job? Why would you, you know, go all in or whatever it is? How, how do you bring team members along if you're not even fully, in, if you're on the edge, like, I'm not sure if this is going to work, who's going to join you on that journey. But then you also have to be extremely humble as to not think you know it all because the market knows it all. And, and you have to kind of accept that you don't know everything. I mean, was that like now reflecting, is that something that you feel like you managed well? Is that something that you battled with? Is it something you weren't even thinking about or aware of until I just mentioned it? How do you see that challenge? I think having confidence is a double-edged sword in this respect, because like I said, if, if you are confident and you genuinely, you know, kind of buy into what you're doing, you can be quite blinkered um, and you can be quite stubborn um and that's you know that's problematic especially when you're working in a you know in a tech startup um for me i guess because i'm not a technical founder and i can't you know code i always had to have my door open in respect of listening to you know external bodies in terms of 
what we could do, how we could do things. Um, ultimately, working with the Early Adopters Hub, I think, helped keep me grounded as well because I thought I had all of the answers and, you know, we were ready to pretty much click the button and launch until um, I saw the Early Adopters Hub post and I think we were, you know, one of the first founders through the door. Um, and I'm really grateful that we went through that experience because we were, you know, I wouldn't say miles wide of the mark, but there were definitely things that needed to be, you know, corrected inside the the app to to make it a viable product for other practices, not just, you know, not just my own. Um, and maybe that's a trap that, you know, other founders will fall into as well, is that they will think, oh, it works for me and it works for my practice, therefore it must work for everyone else. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not that simple. So I was confident in the process, Jack, um, whether we were, you know, completely confident in the outcome at that point, probably not. So I think that's what helps keep you grounded is that when you're talking to other people and you're getting other opinions and you are willing to listen, because I think that's the key thing. It's okay. You, you've got to be able to hear people when they're talking to you, um, not just, you know, kind of pay lip service to it. Um, and I think we were fortunate that we were talking to people that I hadn't spoken to previously or heard their ideas for the early adopters hub. And that's also another important thing because, you know, I've been in and around the industry for 10 plus years now, serve a lot of other people. Um, so it's really useful to speak to people with a fresh perspective and a fresh pair of eyes, um, who are actually in there, in the trenches, doing it day to day is it, that that's invaluable. Um, because you can be confident about something, but if you haven't done it for, you know, two or three years, it doesn't mean that you're the best place to know how to, you know, how to do that. Even though, even though you might have confidence in it, it doesn't mean you can actually do it. Those are, you know, those are two completely different things, aren't they? Um, there's a huge difference between having the intent to do something and actually having the ability to implement something that they're, they're, they're massively different. Oh, thanks for that, John. And, I'll, I'll move the conversation on a little bit. So, I mean, I'll condense a bit your journey in the early adopter sub because the, the purpose of this podcast is not to sell the early adopter sub, even though maybe I'm wrong for that approach. I don't know. In hindsight, I'll know one day. But <laughs> anyway, you know, with the early adopter sub, like you said, you came with a certain product, a certain direction. You wanted to click the press, uh, like the live button and just go to market. We did some initial market research, had some group workshops. You had like the structure to kind of like surface the less biased inside and have very open conversations. Obviously for me also keeping you accountable uh, to listen to the things you don't want to hear and to have the conversation you don't necessarily want to want to have. Uh, as you said, you were like pr pretty much in the first code of founders to go through the early tower sub. So like a lot has also evolved since. Uh, but essentially, we moved to a bit of product research around the existing product, getting some feedback, and, and, and finally did some beta testing for like three firms that were happy to like actually try and implement it and then surface a lot of really good insight and improvements and then kind of like supported you with that initial go to market. And I, I remember quite clearly that that milestone where we had that giant mirror board where uh, I help you build a customer journey. So there's a clear journey and we can iterate it and improve it and see. And then we had that bottom where we have a bubble for each user. Uh, and if and there was like the dead leads that they go to the bottom and you can see in the journey where they got stuck and we can iterate and improve. And I remember one day we got to I don't think, like 30, 40, 50 bubbles. And I was like, John, I think this still we can improve more. And then you're like, no, I think I think we're done. I think there's too many bubbles to manually do this. This now needs to move to a CRM. And I need to kind of like focus on the next step. I think it's kind of like where you, we left off and, and you finished with the early adopters hub that uh, you had that initial product market feed, you had that initial organic growth, word of mouth, a lot of really good indicators. Um, so tug us through kind of like after that, like how, how was the journey uh, a bit after that uh, from there? I think, you know, that's probably at the point where distraction started to to creep, creep in once I got to that kind of you know 40 50 you know 60 and above people in the product um I probably should have been hiring someone at that point to manage that process um I think it's probably you know a big lesson to be learned there you know touched on it earlier that 
yeah, when I say guys who concentrate on one thing, it was the same with this. You know, we were trying to run things on a shoestring, and I was trying to manage and do everything myself. Um, and obviously, I love technology, I love software, I love data. But the problem is when you start putting names into a CRM system, they just then become, you know, a piece of data in a system. And unless you've got someone to manage that and keep on top of that, we had, you know, a really kind of detailed onboarding process and it and it worked it worked well and people were you know being really well looked after from day one the problem with that was it was really labor intensive and for me as the founder trying to do everything to continue providing that level of onboarding service to everybody just wasn't feasible so it started to drift and it started to wane and then you stop getting the insight from those new people coming on board as to what can be improved and what can be, you know, tweaked. Um, and then everyone that was kind of going through the pipeline and was becoming a paid customer kind of stops. And you know, there's a problem in that pipeline somewhere and you know, you need to go and fix it, but you're then trying to raise money and do other things. Um, and the wheels start to, you know, start to wobble. Um, and what I set out to do in providing, you know, that absolutely top notch onboarding process didn't then end up becoming that it became this automated, um, you know, CRM, send some emails out, you know, guide people towards guides and knowledge bases and videos and this, that, and the other. And the reality is, I don't know how many man hours have been put into writing guides and recording videos around the product. No, if, if you listen to one thing from this podcast, nobody reads or watches that shit. Okay. They don't, people need you to guide them through everything. Um, it doesn't matter how slick the production values of these videos and stuff are. N nobody watches them. I can tell you that because I know. <laughs> so with the best, you know, with the best intentions to automate and make stuff, you know, easier. I probably should have bit the bullet and, and employed someone at that point and said, look, your job is just to love these people, cuddle them, you know, make them feel, you know, wanted and loved. Um, but eke as much information out of them as humanly possible that we know we're going down the, you know, going down the right route. Um, I think probably at that point I got distracted and started to learn how to code because I think the frustrating thing when you're doing frontline customer success is you are you're the you're the punch bag of the things that need to be fixed or enhanced um and if your tech guys aren't going quick enough i got sucked into i'll learn how to do this i'll learn how to code because i can't keep having these conversations with people so if that dashboard just needs tweaking or that just needs changing how do you know what it can't be that difficult can it someone show me how to do it and i'll do it myself um and i did but I love that sort of stuff and I probably then got distracted building things that I shouldn't have been doing. I, I should have been concentrating on trying to actually grow the business and, and enhance that side of things um, rather than just going, hey, look, I've just built another dashboard widget. Doesn't it look nice? And, and I guess uh, moving on from there a little bit, John. Uh, well, let, let's get to a couple of juicy wounds and let's uh, really open them up and see what comes out. So I, I think being a side observer to your journey after you finished the early adopters hub, like two key things that I always thought like, well, was something that in hindsight uh, were major negative milestones. Uh, I think one of them is your CTO co-founder living, which I'll put aside for a sec. And the other one uh, is not raising money in time. I think if I remember our conversation correctly, you wanted to stay away from investors and VCs in particular, like like Fire. Uh, you're strongly against them. I mean, I'm keen to hear your reasoning, but I think I suspect it's because you've also been on the other side as as an accountant that's a user and is the target of VC-backed startups that just don't understand accountants and just put it all into marketing. Uh, but you wanted to stay away from raising money other than potential, you know, friends and family that you can get uh, some money from. Uh, and then it seemed to me when you realize I have to raise money to scale this. And like you said, you just, you need more resources. You can't do it all on your own. It was too late. And, and, and also the momentum was starting to go down. So if we start with that wound, what, 
what do you kind of feel around that area of, of not raising money in time? Yeah, look, it's, it's, at the end of the day, any business fails if it runs out of cash, right? Um, and that that's where I found myself. And if I'm being honest, I probably always knew that's where I'd end up being. Um, I, I touched on it earlier. If, if I just have a mentality that I want to do things myself, okay? Um, I don't want to rely on other people. And going and asking for you know for money was kind of like oh, I can do this, and I, if I can do it, and I can do it without having to ask for some money, that would be the absolute ideal you know scenario. So yeah, once you've gone through your own money and you go through family and friends, and you're thinking, oh crap, I need to get some money, it's too late because the process takes a lot longer and eats up so much you know energy. Um, I put myself through a uh, funding accelerator to, you know, to make sure that I was doing the right things and talking to the right sorts of people. And, you know, that process went on for a long period of time. And I think the reality is I'm an accountant. Okay, I'm not a marketeer. I'm not great at selling. I'm not great at marketing. So when your sole existence then becomes around marketing yourself and selling this, you know, ideology, um, it's not something that comes naturally to me. It's not something that I'm comfortable with. So I don't want to do it. And I didn't want to be asking for money in the first place. So, you know, if as the founder, you kind of almost need to be in that position because it looks bad if you're not the one at the front doing those things, but I'm not the right person to be out the front doing those things, you know, because I didn't want to do that. I, don't, I didn't want to be there. There was no passion or enthusiasm for it. So, if you're trying to pitch to someone for, for money and you really don't want to be doing it, that is gonna that is gonna come across and you're not gonna invest money in someone who you're thinking this guy just would rather be anywhere else right now than having this conversation with you know with us. Um so if there's a lack of you know a lack of enthusiasm for going through that process, it's gonna come across, it's gonna make it really, really hard to you know to make money. Um it's not my world. I don't, as you know, you touched on, you know, I've been through this process multiple times with clients that I've worked with. It's never ended well. It, it never has done. Your business does not become your own. Um, most people raise money to either try and accelerate or to exit. You know, that is their, their big plan. And that's what I see with a lot of the apps. They, they haven't come up with these ideas because they have a passion for solving a problem. They have a passion for making money. And they do that by using other people's money who already have a lot of money. Um, I, I think if you've got, you know, if, if you've got a situation where people are doing stuff and their pure motivation is money, that for me, you know, has a much bigger kind of you know problem for the world. And I was quite honest with people when I started this journey that I'm not building hindsight to try and sell it out to somebody. This is not my exit strategy. I am going to be kicking around for a hell of a long period of time um, over and beyond, you know, anything that, um, that I do with hindsight. But the out goal for me was never let's let's make a load of, you know, let's get some some money quickly. Let's get some traction and then let's sell it off and go and do something else. That was was not part of my, you know, part of my pathway. Um, so if I could have held out and not had to raise it, any cash, then that would have been absolutely ideal scenario. However, looking back now, you can't run a software company, do it well, without enough of a runway to get to where you need to, to be. Um, and it, it takes a lot of cash because it's constantly evolving. You know, what we built three years ago, it was, it was okay three years ago. It's not now, not in today's market. You know, if I started again, I'd probably start from scratch. I wouldn't take the existing product and try and, you know, enhance that and build that out and bolt things onto it. So I think you've, I'm not from a background where, you know, people have cash in this whole, you know, concept of, you know, if you can't raise a couple of million pounds sat around the dinner table, then, you know, there's there's something wrong with that. Um, you know, I come from a place where we didn't have a dinner table, you know, <laughs> we sat with plates on our laps. So, it, it was just, I was so far out of my comfort zone on that side of things. 
that it just made me squirm um and it was not you know it was not a, an enjoyable experience probably the least enjoyable part of this whole process that i've been through was that that idea of kind of raising money and having to um you know play play a story um when that's just not me and John, on that, let, let me let me add some salt to your wound. Uh, this is also when I think I came back to your life a little bit, trying to help you there uh, without making any grand promises. Uh, but I could see you're struggling, and I heard from some back channels, some uh, people that came across your deck and basically said it's shit. Uh, yeah. And I came to you and I told you, like, John, this is shit. And you told me, like, yes, I know it is. Uh, I, I mean, essentially, you said, like, you aren't good at raising money. Uh, I think, yeah, at the end of the day, raising money is, is, is selling and it's marketing. Like if you don't have those skills, it can be quite hard, and especially in competitive market. And back then it was a very competitive market and it wasn't as much about the traction. Uh, and I think you have to admit, like you do get penalized if you're not based in London. You don't have, like you said, you don't have that Rolodex of your friends from uh, McKinsey and from Goldman Sachs that can just throw a few hundred thousand uh, pounds and they're not even going to care about it. Uh, it's just maybe a one meter less in the pool. Uh, and then also can introduce you to some VCs because, you know, like uh, I think last I heard the stat, 60% of VCs in, in the UK, in London are mostly people that are management consultants and investment bankers. There's not actually a lot of people that worked in startups. So, uh, I mean, did, and you just you, you hated it and you had every moment of it but did you have any chance of being able to raise money like looking looking back now yeah uh, yeah <laughs> i mean look, i had multiple several conversations with multiple parties um i think realistically even if money had been put on the table would i have taken it I, i'm not even convinced i i would have I would have done and I know like that's probably gonna sound stupid to anybody listening to this that I've got to a point where um you know we're running out of cash. Um I I would have preferred to have gone and started working again and taken a backward step from the company and earned money that way to put into the business, which is the plan that I got to with the CTO before he decided to leave. That's that's where I was at. Um yeah. Look, it's the, the the crazy thing is if I if I was doing this again, I would do exactly the same thing. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. Maybe I'm stupid, I don't know. But um there's something that drives me which I think you know is is more about the process and the learning and the pain um than you know taking the easy route and, and it, it's the same now. I mean I, I like learning, you know, the hard way. Um, and maybe I haven't learned anything. Well, I'll tell you what I have learned. I've learned that if you want to do this, you need to raise money. And I don't want to raise money. And therefore, this is ultimately why I've come to where I am with the business, which is, it's not for me. I'm not the right person to be running this type of entity. Um, and I think that's where a lot of accountants that come into this field will probably also fall down and, and fail because it's not our natural thing. We're not we're not going to be out the front beating the drum, talking about how wonderful we are in, you know, buy my product because it's going to solve all of the world's problems, um, you know, and trying to convince people. And it, it is, like I said, I've been involved in the process enough times with clients to realize it's all just smoke and mirrors. Um, and I don't think if you're an accountant, that is the world that you really deep down, if you're honest with yourself, want to be kind of, you know, dabbling in, which is why in hindsight, I'm saying what I probably should have done is kept the accountancy practice going um, and used the money from that to continue what I was doing with, with hindsight. That's what I should have done. But hey, you know, I didn't. That's life. I. I, d I don't know if I have a question or just an observation from the conversation so far, because I was going to ask the question and then you actually kind of dug, dug deeper into it yourself, which is interesting to hear because I was going to ask if it actually has to be about making money and building a success, quote unquote, successful startup, because you said you did it because you were, you were bored and you wanted to do something different. And you can't say that over the last 
four, five, whatever many years it was that you you didn't go through a journey that kept you busy that, you know, I don't know. Do you see that as, oh, that was well, successful, it, but, you know. It, it, is a, it is a question itself, Jack. If I'm, for me, it's about impact and purpose, right? You know, and if, I, if I'm being honest, I, I sold my practice back in 2018. I was depressed. I had depression, okay? I was... I was in a bad place and I needed, I needed to not be in that business. I needed to be somewhere else doing something else and have a purpose and be able to provide a positive impact to small business owners in a way that I never felt I could run an accountancy practice. So the driver really, I guess for <clears throat> hindsight version 2.0 was savior for myself, but also to try and help small business owners not get into a similar position to me that they feel that, you know, they have to sell their business because they just don't have, you know, any other answers to, to how they're feeling on a day to day basis. Um, so, you know, it gave me that, you know, that impetus to start again and, and do something new and learn some new skills and learn about my myself. But the key thing is, yeah, look, if I could pay my mortgage doing this, then I would, you know, it, it, for me, it was never about exiting for millions of, of pounds. Um, it was about if I could earn a living doing this, then I would continue to do this. And I would enjoy, you know, I know that I would enjoy doing that. Um, the great thing with being a qualified accountant is ultimately, if things don't work out for you doing this, there are plenty of job opportunities out there for good people. Okay. So that is, you know, kind of one upside when people go and God, you're mad. You put all of your money into this. It's like, hey, what's the worst that can happen to me? I go back to being an accountant and earning good money doing that, and that is my first love. And I do enjoy doing accountancy. You know, I'm, I'm not one of those accountants that oh, I hate it. I wish I'd retrain and do something else. I enjoy doing what I'm doing. So in that respect, I always had a luxury fallback, which if this didn't work, oh God, I'd have to go and do accountancy again. You know, and that's what I'm doing. And I found a passion and enthusiasm for doing that again. Um, and that's probably just me in a nutshell. I will constantly evolve into doing different things because I like to learn. And I like to progress and I like to feel like I'm making some form of positive impact on somebody's life somewhere along the, along the line and making loads of money for people that have already got money is not high on my <laughs> list of agenda of things to do in in life because i i can honestly say even if i'd say i'd exited and i've I'd made millions doing this next week i would have put that money into something else because that's just <laughs> that's just who i am so john i think if if we move forward a little bit well forward and backwards um let, let's open another battle scar uh so your cto leaving uh for me as a side observer to your journey and i've told that honestly i felt like that was the beginning of the end really uh so yeah why don't you tell us a bit more about what what happened there and lessons and mistakes yes i think yeah you're absolutely right johan i think it, it, it I don't like to think of it as kind of the beginning of the end, but ultimately it, it was. Um, we'd we'd invested a lot of kind of time and energy into this, and ultimately, you know, Mike, bless him, just got dragged along for the the ride with me. Um, it was me that was kind of leading the you know leading the charge and making the decisions and putting the money in um, to to kind of keep us you know to keep us going. Now, when we got to a point, I think you've got to have people in a business who are not massively risk averse. Um, and, you know, my CTO's existence was about providing for his family and, you know, living a decent existence. So when we got to a point where, you know, we were having conversations around, we've only got X months worth of cash left. It wasn't a case of right. What do we what do we do? How do we fix this? It was all right. Okay, well, I've, I've actually started looking for jobs, and I've got a new position, and um, you know, I'm I'm off ski, and it was like, oh crap! I thought we were in this together, um, and we would we would work our way through this. 
Um, and I had a list of options. Like I said, you know, one of them was me going back and doing, you know, going doing day work. And we'd kind of worked out that actually, if I did that, we could have earned enough money to, you know, to pay him and keep keep moving forward. When you're not the technical founder and that person leaves, you are, you know, you, you're left high and dry. Um, it's difficult. So we outsourced, we found a team of outsourcers in India, handed over to them. It was a completely different business for me at that point. You know, like I said, I'd worked with Mike through numerous companies. Um, we get on really well. We still do now. There's no, you know, there's no kind of, you know, animosity between the, between the pair of us. We tried something, it didn't work. You know, that's, that's it. He lives two roads away from me. I see him most mornings walking a dog type thing, you know, so it's, there's no getting away from each other in that respect. Um, but yeah, it was a body blow. I'm not going to lie because it did feel at that point that the world was against me. Um, and when the person closest to you then says, all of these suggestions are great, but I've already looked for a job and I'm, I'm going and I'm going here, sort yourself out. It was a kind of, you know, it was a punch to the guts and it hurt, but not in a way that I felt bad towards him because he had to do what he needed to do for his family, right? That's what we're all, you know, that's what we're all kind of geared and designed towards is you, you look after your yourself and your immediate family first and foremost, you know, it's why when you're on a plane, they say put your, put your face mask on first because you can't help anybody else if you're not looking after, you know, not looking after your family. Um, so I get it. I understand it. Maybe he's got more sense than me um, because I still kept going for, you know, a good year after that, but working with an outsourced development company in India. And that, it was it was painful. You know, it was painful because I'm quite creative. Um, so I will just throw things at Mike and say, I think we should do this and it needs to look like this and it needs to have this functionality. And he'll go, okay. And he knew what I meant because he knew me so well. Other people don't. They're just like, this guy's a raving lunatic. You know, what's what's going what's going on? And the first kind of real wobble we had was about a week after Mike had exited the business, the system went down for two days. It fell over because we'd had such a deluge of new people coming on board that something that, you know, we hadn't built out correctly failed. And of course, these new guys have come in they don't know the system, they don't know the code. And the first thing they've got to deal with is me going absolutely ballistic at them because I need the system to work. And they're like, we're working as fast as we can. So from day one, that relationship was strained because they just thought I was a, you know, <laughs> a terrible person to work with. He was just gonna jump up and down and, and shout a lot. And it's like, that's not, you know, that's not me all of the time. Um, so, you know, it was a difficult, it was a baptism of fire for them. And it just made me realize how out of my depth I was um, and how difficult it was going to be without having um, an internal resource. Yeah, someone who can almost finish your sentences for you um, without, you know, amount of detail and being able to put that into a product. Um, so yeah, you know, it was it was tough. And I think at that point, yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. And part of me probably went, if I don't do this with Mike, do I actually really want to be, you know, doing this? Um, because, you know, we'd got to that point together um, and it wasn't about, well, I guess in a way, if, if, if Mike was here and we'd made some money and I was able to, you know, help him pay his mortgage off and stuff like that, then for me, that would have been an absolute, you know, that would have been a massive win. Um, when you're doing it for yourself, because, you just want to, you know, make that impact and you're not too worried about the finance, you know, side of things, which coming from an accountant's mouth is probably hideous for most people to hear, but I don't really care about the finance side of my own business. I'm very good at looking after other people's stuff, mine, whatever, you know, if I've got it, I'm going to spend it. I'm not taking it with me. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a difficult period and, one where I kind of almost looked at myself in the mirror and thought, if I can't convince Mike to be along this journey with me after all this time, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna struggle to I'm gonna struggle with this. No, thanks for that, John. And and again, kind of like sharing that that difficult experience. 
Uh, one final question from my end, and I think then Jack will will wrap up as we kind of like are getting closer to the one hour mark. Uh, so, I mean, essentially after that, I mean, you had a few pivots, you tried a few different things, you tried to wrap a service around it that's paid, you even went into some firms and actually use hindsight for them. Uh, so what ultimately led you after that to like the decision, like, that's it, like, I've given it a good go. It's it's time to shut down. We we did, yeah. We tried several things. We tried um, running programs, looking after people's apprenticeships and uh, apprentices, and training them how to use the product properly. Um, Is it ready yet? We um, it's my kids asking if breakfast is ready. No children, if breakfast is not ready. Um, then yeah, then we worked with some firms where we actually, you know worked as if we were in their firm helping them um that didn't work either i mean if i'm being honest probably the turning point for me and the thing that made me realize that i just needed to stop doing this was when we asked the kids what they wanted for christmas and they said a hot shower <laughs> because for me you know we, we did not have a hot working shower in my house for two years right because i couldn't afford a luxury of fixing the shower so when when your when your kids reach out to you and say all I want for Christmas is a working shower, at that point you kind of you know you need to call it a day, um, and you know I, being perfectly honest, you, you know Johan, we've had this conversation previously. I, I had nowhere else to turn. I had begged, borrowed, and stolen money from every you know family member and corner of the planet that I that I could um you know payment holidays on the mortgage the, the whole you know the whole work so when and i would have kept going if i could have borrowed more um but yeah when when the kids are saying look we we just want something as basic as that and you're going i can't even provide that to my family you know <laughs> you know the writing is on the wall and you you need to grow up i think that's probably the the, the learning experience for me is that at that point, I had to grow up and actually be a parent and <laughs> and provide for my family. I mean, there's been so much in this conversation, John. That's probably the most, uh, you know, open anyone's been with us. So, no, I appreciate the entire journey. And I think the the whole conversation around when to walk away is a hard one in the circle of founders because there's a, I guess there's an environment of, you know, you want to support each other to keep going. Uh, you know, we spoke to Guy on our podcast as well and some of his advice was you just got to keep pushing through all the barriers. You just like, you know, like you never, ever quit. And, and it's a real, I think it's a challenge because a lot of the survivors, the ones who do push through all of the walls and get out the other side successful, they preach it. But then there's so many who punch through walls over and over again just to never make it. So you know, to I, to I find, still, I would still be doing that, Jack. Don't don't get me wrong. I would still be punching through these walls. But the reality is, you can't do it alone. And, and when I say that, I don't mean like mm. you no know, having no CTO or whatever. I mean you can't do these things without the support of the people around you. And you also have to stop at some point and reset and go. Why am I doing this? Like, who is this for? Because I want to make everyone else's lives better. That's why I was building this product, because I wanted to make small business owners' lives better. And I wanted to make their accountants' lives easier and better by having this product to better serve their, their clients. But if the people behind you, who are always going to have your back, are at the point where they're saying, you need to stop because we might not recover from this, you have to you have to stop and take stock of that and i could have kept going and I, and I probably would have kept going but i would end up a very lonely old man somewhere um and i don't really want that i'm not good on my own i need i need people around me <laughs> and you never know maybe there's uh hindsight 3.0 somewhere in the future as well so hopefully it's not it's not all lost, but I mean, to, to kind of get towards wrapping up something we usually ask the founders that, that we interview like this is for them to share a tar pit idea or concept with us. And I've written down like 
six or seven from this conversation. And one in particular that I, I almost want to challenge you on because you said it from one angle and then another angle. And it was this, this idea of going all in rather than having a business on the side that can fund you. Uh, you know, you, it sounds like in the initial kind of, uh, you know, in the early days you were supported by a cash flow generating business. Then the advice was you've got to go all in and you've got to focus. And then in hindsight, you've kind of reflected to say, well, maybe it would have been smarter to keep the business. I've also heard that, that, uh, recommendation from successful founders before, which is to say, oh, you've got to go all in. Uh, you know, if your focus is anywhere else, you, it's game over. Whereas part of me feels that the, that that's not necessarily fact that there's a, there's a, Yes, for some it does work, but for many, there's a perfectly good way of going about it is to have a a cash flow positive business off to the side that then funds your startup. But I'd love to get your take now on both sides. Yeah, so yeah, look, it's, it's, it's great to look back and go, we well, should have done this, should have done that. In, in essence, we actually we tried to have a cash flow positive business running alongside hindsight. So. I actually bought, so with some of the exit money from, from Smart, I actually bought a, a company called Event HQ, and it was an online booking system similar to Eventbrite. And that was a business that I bought from an ex-client, and it was generating cash, and it was a very, very light touch. So we went, do you know what? We'll buy this business for a few grand. We'll, we'll spruce it up. We'll get some cash coming in from that. That will support us. Everything will be good. It'll be fine. Then the pandemic hit and um, <laughs> we'd bought an online events booking system for live events, not for online events. It was all geared towards live events, people being in places. And it was a fabulous system for that. But for us to convert it into competing with like Hop and came about at that time with, you know, massive valuation. Of the rest of it, we just went, oh, shit, overnight, that business, that kind of idea of having this cash business running alongside just disappeared. Um, you know, it was it was a car crash. And uh, but that was just one of those things, you know, I, I couldn't have predicted that uh, we were going to go into a, you know, a global shutdown. Um, I probably could have kept smart running alongside what we were doing if my heart was in it. Like I said, at the time I was in a really bad place and I just, I didn't have the passion and enthusiasm for it. And I didn't want to be working with small business owners and, and their businesses if I couldn't put myself into that business and enjoy it and enjoy working with them. You know, when, when, if your clients are phoning or, or emailing and, and your kind of first reaction is, oh, God, no, you probably shouldn't be doing that thing. And I know there might be a lot of accountants who do that all day, every day listening to this. My advice to those guys would be go and do something else or, or find a hobby or something that, you know, you enjoy doing to, to get through the get through the days. Um, if your business is established like mine was and it runs itself why wouldn't you have that run alongside? I'd been through the pain of extracting myself from the business on a day-to-day -day basis by doing the just ad tech stuff. So my clients were used to me not being the main point person anymore. So I was kind of almost extracted from that business anyway. Um, in that respect, it can work. But if you are running an operation that does involve your day-to-day involvement and take up a lot of your time and consume your energy, then I think it's really difficult to, to start something new, particularly when it's new in terms of, you know, I don't have the technical expertise, so I'm learning so much new stuff here. I'm having to learn new skills around customer success. I'm having to learn about the tech side of things. I'm having to think about raising money. If I was still day to day in smart being the accountant, there's no way I could do those two things. Well, let me rephrase. There's no way I could do those two things and do either of them well. And that's where you've kind of got to go. If I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this to the best of my abilities, I probably need to be concentrating on just one thing. However, my advice would be is if you have a business that can stand on its own two feet and it's a light touch and you have minimal involvement, why wouldn't you keep that kind of running alongside? 
The only reason you wouldn't do that, Jack, is probably if you were trying to raise money early, because you, you, you subconsciously, what you'd be thinking is, if I'm trying to raise money for this business, if I'm a, a, an investor, am I going to want this person splitting their time between these different businesses? No, I'm going to want them to run themselves into the ground and run through walls for me. So they can't have other business interests and stuff going on, you know, over there. So I think to quantify, you know, that, that kind of question is you can, but I think it depends on the individual circumstances of, of what somebody is, is trying to achieve. With that, John, uh, and getting past the one, I'll mark, I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, huge thanks. I think you lived up to the promise that I, uh, I, I was hoping, being very, very open, very honest, uh, and, and really like letting us uncover all the details. So really appreciate that. I think there's just so much insight and so much learning to like future founders and early stage founders. Uh, that is important uh, insight to, to hear. Uh, a lot you've learned in hindsight from hindsight, uh, last, last hindsight joke. Um, and, and again, really appreciate it. I feel like it was half post-mortem, half therapy session uh, that you're <laughs> airing out to the world. Luckily for you, a very, very niche podcast for account tech uh, founders. So there's not too many listeners. So hopefully your, your therapy session is a, a bit of a closed loop there. Uh, but yeah, again, can, can't thank you enough for that, John. Uh, really enjoyed this one hour that kind of like really flew by. Uh, and yeah, and I'll see you for hindsight version three. Yeah, just let me build another business first and sell that one. <laughs> Thanks, John. See ya. Thanks, Thanks, John. Cheers, guys.